Chris has given us a flavour of his own recent work, which I think is going to lead us all in very positive directions. He's posed some meta questions, if I may use that term, to the panel. And Linda, would you like to start by answering your question? And then David and then Jan. And then we'll open it to the floor. Um, I'm sorry that you asked me first, because uh, I would have liked more time. Um, <laughs> clearly, on what basis does one select one particular life is the criticism or the objection that uh, historians have traditionally posed to the biographical method, group biography, family biography. Um, and at a certain level, I accept the validity of it. Um, I suppose as a historian, I've always believed that one does what one can. Uh, not every individual uh, leads uh, an archival trail. Um, my argument was more about the desirability of at least looking at some individuals and introducing some individual stories into overarching surveys. I think that's the most important thing. And it does seem to me that as more and more of this kind of work is being done, more and more surprising lives emerge, uh, and a greater variety of lives emerge from the archives. Um, naval archives, slave archives, can clearly tell one set of crudely establishment stories. But you can also ransack them for all kinds of unpredictable existences. I think the amount of archival bureaucracy, uh, and of course, uh, it doesn't give everybody equal spread, but it is beginning to turn up now some really rather remarkable stories. Uh, work that's going on at the moment with black slaves, work that's going on uh, by people like Derba Ghosh about the uh, indigenous Indian wives of British troops. Um, these stories are there. Um, I don't think one can privilege this. I don't want to privilege any form of global history writing. Uh, but I do think there's enormous potential there. I think we're still at the beginning. Um, and so my answer would be one doesn't have necessarily just to select some particular lives. I think all kinds of diverse lives there, and, and that's beginning to emerge. So that would be my rather soggy liberal answer to your <laughs> query. Um, yeah, well, good question. Maybe <laughs> um, an hour or two. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I, I was interested in the way that your history of liberalism leads towards this consideration of uh, issues of right. Um, I think what I was suggesting was, well, one might start, um, might, might start from there um, simply strategically in a certain way, because it's not only through liberal constitutionalism that uh, these different um, ideologies of right come to be expressed. And in fact, mm -hmm. some, some um, Indian ideas of right move in you know, rather different directions, which certainly are not terribly liberal or, or constitutional. Um, Yes, I mean, the point I was making was simply about, about doing it that way it does it create the impression still that ideas come from Europe and are taken up by other people or are translated by other people rather than trying to open the thing up a little bit more from the other side that there's a process of exchange which creeps through. So, I mean, my own work is very much concerned with ideas about, about property rights and what one means by it. That involves conceptions of the state, conceptions of society, conceptions of... Of the um, uh, of, of the individual, um, in the Indian case, one's naturally linked because of the long-term history from India into the Islamic world on the on the one side with a, a particular set of conceptions of right, but also um, out towards Southeast Asia and southern India, particularly another one, um, ideas about settlement, ideas about the role of religion. Um, the extent to which religion um, provides an alternative system validating property rights to, to the state. 
um, a continuing issue and a set of problems in, in South Asian society, um, which do, does, I think, distinguish it somewhat uh, uh, from Europe. Uh, it's not that easy to distinguish, I think, a, a, a secular political theory um, in quite the same way as one comes to develop in Europe from the, the 16th or 17th century. Um, so, what, in a certain sense, whilst I think we may end up in many ways converging on the same point, um, my own work would, would try, as it were, to begin with the Indian end of this, and then um, precisely with these conceptions of uh, rights, above all, perhaps, in, embedded in conceptions of property rights, and look at the way that these compare, connect, shift and move as an underlying basis for thinking about political theory. Well, uh, by sheer luck, I had more time to think about Chris's question than my uh, co-panelists here, but it hasn't done me any good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let me see. The question is, as I, I might, well, rephrase it the way I understand it. Uh, uh, how does the uh, industrious uh, revolution, thinking of uh, households and their consumer aspirations and their means of achieving them, uh, relate to the uh, industrial revolution as we move forward from the point of origin of this phenomenon in the early modern period, as I see it, into the 19th and 20th century? Well, here in, in, we're thinking in global historical terms, the, the first thing that comes to mind is this. The diffusion of the industrial system uh, from its point of origin in Britain in the 18th century to, was, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, was a very uneven thing. It moves slowly onto the European continent and does not even conquer that. Right? It, it meets what uh, I think David Landis in his classic study of Prometheus Unbound called firewalls uh, as one gets into Central Europe, this kind of uh, gefella of, uh, of uh, relative development. Uh, in which the, industrial pro the industrialization is, uh, spreads to a number of countries and then kind of comes to an end. And from then until very recently, we've had, you know, we've spoken of north and south and of the developed and the underdeveloped world, and all of this sort of thing. But the diffusion of the industrious, this industrious uh, posture of households, of consumer aspirations, and of uh, the seeking for strategies to achieve uh, a sort of a new material world a new material life, that diffused much more quickly. Not, I would say, not universally, but, uh, but globally, nonetheless. And that, create, that has created, all through the last 200 years, I think, a tension. Uh, a tension between household aspirations and their means of achieving them. And then what strategies are there? This is not a story of a uniform process, but rather of a very differentiated set of responses. Only in a few areas was the response locally achieved through the development of industrial economies and employment and high wages. In others, it was responded to through migration, still is going on today on an enormous scale. Uh, uh, there are selective, and then the adaptation locally of selective aspects of a, what I'll call a, 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 the, a material life of, a, of a, a Western country, or a specific decision not to do so. Right? These are all in a way responses to this challenge and a product of that tension. I suppose if I were trying to you know, be a true global historian with the, with the topic that Chris gave me, it would, my challenge would be to lay out this, uh, this patterned and layered uh, a set of responses and, and then see how the global system uh, has new challenges because of them. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm going to abuse my position as chairman to just raise a general point, which I hope, well, two general points, which I hope will come up in the course of the conference, perhaps at the end of the round table. We have a large number of distinguished historians here from all over the world, from India, from China, from the Ottoman Empire, and I would just like to ask them if they were writing a global history, what would it look like? What sort of methodologies would they use which would not be Eurocentric? Or would they disdain the enterprise altogether? Would they think this is something that they would want to disdain, that they wouldn't want to do? That's one thing. The other thing I think we sort of is missing from this whole uh, discussion that we've had 
is that one of the big things about global history is the unification with natural history, with geography. <coughs> the big books of Jerry Diamond and David Christian are not here. And I hope they can come in, because I think both of those books say to me and my students anyway, they, my students really <coughs> like them, they say really big things about global history and world history. They are not. You don't have a panel on those guys, but I think it's... Of course, you can't do everything, but I think, I think somewhere in one of these panels we ought to raise those two things. Those are my questions, and I don't want anyone to answer them now, but I just want them laid on the table. And can we, can we have the first question from the floor? Thank you. Um, actually, I have a, a comment for David. Yeah, uh, a comment for David and, and Chris, uh, if you'd like to reflect on something for David and Polly, but she says she's not here, perhaps somebody else can reflect on it. Uh, <laughs> Jan, please, I think I will uh, read my response for the afternoon when I will give you my version of how I want to challenge the uh, late Wobi Gontes or whatever it is. I mean, it's used the microphone. Yeah, so, um, to Chris and, and, and David. You know, one of the very curious uh, outcomes, uh, uh, I think, uh, unexpected outcomes of the global history business in the last 15 years has been uh, the emergence of a very particular narrative regarding the universal human rights. Uh, I'm thinking of the work of a number of different people. Uh, for example, my own uh, colleague, uh, Le Hunt, wrote a recent book on the trajectory of universal human rights. John Headley has written an extremely conservative book on this, which actually is attempting to rescue uh, European uh, exceptionalism, basically by arguing that universal know, human rights are Europe's gift to the world. Um, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a potentially very nasty process, and in fact, uh, it leads one to ask actually what purpose universal human rights really serve other than kicking other people sometimes. Uh, so I'm asked, actually wondering whether, in terms of the, the history of these sorts of ideas of travel, uh, is it possible, do you think, to actually address this issue of universal human rights as something which is a more complex issue than simply something which has a moment of birth, let's say, in the French Revolution or thereabouts, and then is, is diffusionist, uh, a kind of diffusionist paradigm that is spread across the world? Because I think that this is really where, if you want to kind of come back to the problem of global history as any kind of a moral or immoral enterprise, I think that this is really where uh, some of the, 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 uh, the real uh, uh, danger lies. So I was actually uh, going to ask the question of whether you've reflected on people who have actually written on this problem of reconciling uh, microhistory and global history uh, at a more methodological level. I'm thinking in particular of the Italian microhistorians. Actually, uh, we have a very interesting essay by Ginsburg not so long ago on a man called Purim, and where he's actually using the biographical narrative and drawing on the work of his, the older work of his colleague, uh, Eduardo Berendi on the idea of what he calls the normal exception. And I wonder whether in relation to that set of reflections, you could actually come back to this question. Because it seems to me there's, there's some uh, potential over there, as opposed to, let's say, uh, what I consider to be Natalie Davis' rather disappointing methodological incursions in, in, uh, in the Leo Africanus book, which actually doesn't address any of these, and makes it, you know, Leo Africanus is, is interesting because he might have had a conversation with Lavelle as if he should care. <laughs> Do you, do you want us to respond or do you want yes, to take some questions? Yes, yes, I think we do. I don't think we'll get the questions. So okay, I mean, like that. that's a very important question. I'm, I'm sure that my very brief presentation did tend to privilege the notion of rights as jolly good things, which expand and are taken up and have elective affinities with rights elsewhere. It's not simply a diffusionist argument. And I wanted to say that, it, and I think I did hint at one point, that rights could actually be used as, as oppressive forms. For instance, I can think of uh, two examples. One, uh, one of our graduate students, Simon Layton, is working on piracy. And of course, the notion of piracy is in one way is making the sea safe, but it's in other ways it's smashing local types of maritime kingdoms in much of the rest of the world. Of course, we know the story about the anti-slave movement, which in so many cases led to territorial incursions into other sovereignties. And again, another interesting example would be the way that the notion of moving rights as opposed to land rights of the sort that David was talking about uh, is related, for instance, to the creation of an international maritime labor force, the Lascars. A lot of the debates uh, in and around the East India Company, even by radicals, are about the rights 
of Lascars, except it's not really about the rights of Lascars, it's the way you deal with the existence of people who move across <coughs> boundaries, global, global people if you like, and a way therefore of making it possible to exploit their labour more effectively. So I think you're absolutely right that there is a, a great ambivalence and ambiguity about the way these new global forms of idea are taken up in various different contexts. But of course that's history and we just, as you're saying, we have to be aware of it and not create triumphalist narratives. Um, well, yes, I'm more or less follow along um, along the same lines. I mean, well, one of the uses, perhaps, of a global history is to create a comparative sense of, of rights and human rights and how uh, what is meant by these in, in different particular contexts, and also to bring in, as it were, certain forms of non-European conception to critique European ones. I mean, there are arguments that sort of really radical theories of right, which um, uh, put the individual rather than the gendered or whatever um, uh, uh, individual in society um, at the centre of these and, and, and demand complete uh, universal freedoms are in fact completely inapplicable, I mean completely unrealisable, always have been. You couldn't conceive of a, of a society in which they operated and what they give rise to, I just mentioned it, is the US's relationship with somewhere like Guantanamo Bay, the corollary to having US freedoms is the need to, or the, uh, ultimately the practical necessity to create realms of unfreedom where uh, um, uh, you, you handle awkward and difficult problems. The United States has always done that. It kept people at sea on ships for their entire lifetime so that they couldn't actually t land in the United States and claim uh, um, uh, uh, their rights. And you know, one side of a very liberal political system is um, a rather dark oppressive side, and those things precisely, I think, need to be opened up. And the whole question of um, the, re the relationship between individual rights and social rights to be, be explored in this broader area. I think it's my turn. Um, thank you for uh, referring me to that piece, which sounds very interesting. I will uh, endeavour to look at it. Uh, what I would want to add to what has been said about rights is uh, the way that another piece of political vocabulary is moving around different parts of the world, uh, particularly in the last third of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century, and that's the concept of subjecthood, uh, which becomes extremely elastic and can be exploited by different groups in all sorts of ways as a kind of right. I mean, it's one of the things, as Chris Brown shows, uh, that the abolitionists are increasingly playing with, certainly in regard to Britain, uh, the idea that slaves in certain parts of the world where the, the British predominate uh, can claim rights as British subjects. But the stress is not so much rights, but on being subjects, uh, which allows them certain legal positions, certain rights of protection. Um, and I think the it's a, it's a wonderfully slippy, or can be a wonderfully slippy term, uh, and a lot more work needs to be done on that. Not just rights in the French Revolutionary, American Revolutionary time, but older notions of subjecthood are being reinvented and are masticizing, if you like, in different parts of the world, and that, that needs more work. If I could just, just to pick up, we're all thinking on as we as we run along, and so I mean I, I think the question of rights needs to be looked at in, in in relation also to obligation, which often tends to be left out, uh, and that provides a, I, I think a, a focus in which one can do some very interesting comparative um, work, looking at uh, the extent to which the exercise of particular rights depends also upon the acceptance of certain kinds of obligations, and they're one of the problems with the more radical version of Western rights is that there seems to be no obligation attached <coughs> to the concept of, 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 of human rights. 